welcome to a lesson on how to answer CISSP questions. Something to remember before we get into the actual lesson is that there are throwaway questions in the exam. These are called beta questions. The purpose of these questions, as ISC squared states, and these questions again are not in the CBK, the common body of knowledge, these are just questions that ISC squared may use for statistical purposes. They might use them to direct how the exam is going to go for you. They might use these questions for their own internal purposes. The bottom line with these is we don't really know why they're there. Only ISC squared knows. And it's probably just to help them to improve their exam overall and your exam experience. So keep that in mind. So let's get into the lesson. The types of questions that you'll come across are the kind, first of all, that have too much information. Too much information is included in the question to either confuse you on the front of the question or in the response options that you choose from, the A, B, C, or D. So it can be in either one of those, and what you have to do is look for the bottom line. We'll talk about that a little bit more with some examples. Another type of question is the vague question, where it's the opposite of TMI, too much information. You would get too little information. So with the vague questions, you have to either fill in the gaps or you have to pick the best of the worst options. And sometimes all of the options look like good options. Again, we'll look at some examples, or one example of each one of these. Another type of question you'll get is a, one that focuses on steps of a process and what happens at each step of the process. So make sure that when you're reading the books and studying that you do your best to memorize the steps, but not just memorize the steps, but what happens during each step or each phase of something. Another type of question you'll get is in the kind that uses alternate wording. In other words, taking a word and using a thesaurus or something to change the word. Basically taking the word and replacing it with something that has the same meaning. A word that looks totally opposite but has the same meaning. And on the flip side of that, you will have questions that have the same words but are in a different context. So for example, the word collision. You'll find collision in domain three when you are studying hashes, and you'll also come across the word collision in domain four when you're studying uh, collision domains, uh, carrier sense, multiple access, all that stuff. So watch for, for that type of thing. So the method to respond to these questions is basically you're going to use a process of elimination so understand the question, but then this is ultimately what you're going to do. And I like to think of baseball or like sports in general. So you would use the you're out method, basically meaning that you're going to, out of the four options, you're going to eliminate one by one the options that don't seem viable. So let's get into the examples. Here's one of too much information. The question is, what is the best method to prove the origin of a message? Now. That doesn't look like TMI, right? But in this question, the, the too much information is going to be in the potential responses. So option A, so let's run through this. Option A says run the cryptogram through a cipher. Now remember, this is also a good example of replacing alternate wording. So cryptogram just means the cipher text. So remember that. Run the cryptogram through a cipher using an out-of-band symmetric key that you know that way you know the key came from the right person. Okay, so let's think about this. Run the ciphertext through a cipher using an out-of-band symmetric key. Do symmetric keys provide proof of origin? No, they do not. So we know that option A is out. B. Run the cryptogram, or the ciphertext, through a cipher, which is an algorithm, using the sender's private key. Well, if you've studied this domain, you already know there's an issue with this because this question assumes that we have the sender's private key, which we wouldn't. If we did, then that particular algorithm would, not, would basically be useless. You could not provide proof of origin with that. So we know the option B is out. Option C says decrypt the message using the sender's key encrypting key and using the encrypted key to re-encrypt the cipher. Well, the problem with this option is you can't use an encrypted key in a cipher because it's just cipher text. So we know that option C is out, so it must be option D, and let's read it just to make sure. 
This one says, okay, and remember we're looking for proof of origin. Always keep the question in mind when you're reading through these. Run the cryptogram through a cipher using the sender's public key, verifying that it must have been encrypted with the sender's private key. Okay, if you spaced out like I just did right now, let's read it again. Run the, the cipher text or the cryptogram through a cipher using the sender's public key. That sounds about right. Verifying that it must have been encrypted with the sender's private key. That sounds right. So and that is the answer. Answer D, or option D is the correct answer. So I do have a video on asymmetric cryptography if you haven't studied that domain. That uh, is a good video to understand how asymmetric cryptography works and how asymmetric can provide proof of origin. So let's get into the vague question. Before any penetration test activities are performed, what must be considered? Let's look at our options. Management approval potential impact to organizational assets, management oversight, and potential impact to asset values. Now pay attention to the wording in this question. Before any penetration test activities are performed, what must be considered? Does, is management approval required for activities? Well, I believe at this phase, when you're doing the activities, you already have the management approval. So you don't need the management approval although that would seem to be a good option but let's look at B potential impact so before you select your answer always read through all the options read through them several times potential impact to organizational assets I like that one quite a bit because that's basically remember that an asset what's the definition of an asset it's not always data it could be appliances that use the data so we're talking about servers and data centers um, network closets things like that so you want to make sure that you're considering what could happen to the operations, basically. Uh, this is just wording it differently. If you say impact to organizational assets, you're basically saying what's the impact to operations. Management oversight. That's a good one, too. But uh, management oversight is kind of a different thing. You wouldn't consider, you would consider that throughout the entire process of pen test, whether uh, from the very beginning to the very through to the very end. So I would not go with that one. I'm liking B so far. D says potential impact to asset values. The problem with this one is that you're talking about values and that is, that's a potentially good answer but would you, in this case since it's vague you have to pick the best of the worst so and not saying that these are all bad these are all actually okay options but again they're vague so you just have to pick the best one. Which one would sit at the top? Which one would be the king of the hill? And I would say option B. Here's a question. Unplugging the network cable from an infected machine might be an example of which step of the incident management process? We have A, remediation, B, mitigation, C, response, and D, recovery. Now, the CBK, the common body of knowledge, is very specific about what happens at each phase. And this may be different from the terminology that you use. So if you've read the books, and gone through the classes, the online classes, and the free training and all that stuff, then you would know that exactly which one this is referring to. So when you're talking about incident management, when you unplug the network cable, all you're doing is unplugging. Don't assume that anything else is happening except for what they give you in this question. So unplugging the network cable from an infected machine. That's it. What are you doing? Are you remediating? Are you mitigating? Are you responding? Or are you recovering? Remediation would be how you would address the root cause. I'm not sure. One of these R's is for the root cause. It's either response or remediation. I do know for a fact that mitigation is the immediate action that you take to basically stop the bleeding. B is the option. So that's kind of the process that you would follow. Okay, so let's look at some that use similar or alternate wording. So here is the question. It is, what is the difference between a token ring and a token? Okay, so when you come across a question like this, you have to remember that they're probably crossing domains. And so when they're talking about a token, they're probably talking about something from domain five, which is authentication or identification and access management. So a token, remember a token is an authentic authentication mechanism of some kind, right? So it could be physical or logical. And it, as it turns out, B is the correct answer. So again, some of the, the questions are going to be worded this way in, in all the practice exams that you take and, and probably in the real exam too. I mean, who, who knows really what's going to be in the real exam. So again, I want to reiterate, and I did this in a previous video, knowledge of the CBK, of the common body of knowledge, is going to really get you through this exam and nothing else. 
So there is a website, cissprep.net. Take a look, it's free. See how many of those you can answer. And as always, thanks for watching, and I hope this video has been helpful. Have a great day.